Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Living Proof. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice to see all your smiling faces here this afternoon. We're going to go ahead and open up with a word of prayer before we begin with worship. Lord, we're so thankful for another day to worship you, another time to come to your house to gather in your name. Lord, we, we ask that uh, our praise would be sweet this afternoon, that it would be a sweet sound in your ears, and that everything that is said and done in this service would be honoring to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> you're welcome to stand with us if you're able as we sing these worship songs.
may be seated. today would want to make that your prayer. Open our eyes. Amen. We want to see more of Jesus. Jesus. Linda and I had a rough night last night. It's like Tuesday nights. We don't have the best night sleeping for some reason. It's like the devil's fighting us knowing we're coming here for ministry on Wednesdays. But God, we look to him we can look to him for our comfort and our prayer for that. And just coming here it means so much to us and being able to minister. And we're, we're looking to you today too for anyone else that has anything that need, that has a need for us to bring to, to the Lord today. If you could just raise your hand, uh, a need that we can pray about. We've got some other needs here today. Uh, it's just... We want to open our eyes to the Lord of what He has for us. Yes. Uh, being able to come here and being able to be a part of this. Lord, we gather today in Your presence. Your presence filling this room today, Lord. We give You all the glory 
And for all these hands that are raised today too, you know the, the need, the situation, whatever is going on in their lives, without it even being said. But by that upraised hand, we're acknowledging that we're giving it to you today. There's uh, so many issues and things that are across for our church, different things going on here. There's others that are on our prayer list today too that we would bring to you today. Tom and Doreen's story are recovering from surgeries for them. Marion Moore, she's got some more medical tests. I think she was supposed to have had a surgery. Margaret Wolf still continued healing with this cancer issue that she's got going. Lord, we give that to you. You are bigger than cancer. You are bigger than that. Augie Mensick, same thing. He's recovering from his surgery with his cancer issues. And anyone else that has something, Lord, we give that to you today. Uh, even if they're not mentioned here, Lord, you know the issues. We thank you, Lord, for your answers, your promises to us that you will be here. You will be with us. You are in our midst. And you will be here. Thank you, Lord, for your answers for us today. We give you all the glory. We give you all. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 We're so glad you came to worship with us today. His presence is here in this place. Amen. There's just a few things that we want to bring to your attention that are upcoming. If you're coming back this evening, we have our last Summer Connect Night under the stars following the service at 8 o'clock. I believe the men's and women's ministries are serving nachos tonight. So that'll be a good time out on the field that um, you can be a part of the time of fellowship and, and just um, connecting with one another. Uh, next Wednesday, the 24th, is our prayer and praise night, and Pastor Josh has also called the church to a church-wide fast that day. If you are able to be here at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary, all of the adult ministries will be coming together that evening for a time of prayer and worship. And if you are interested in going to the baseball game with the church on Friday, September 2nd, there are still some tickets available for that. You can pick those up in the church office or at the Welcome Center on Sunday. They are $15 each, and it's just going to be a fun time of fellowshipping outside the church walls um, just for a great evening. And uh, we look forward to that as well. If you are signed up for senior camp at Pinecrest for the day um, that we are going up on Thursday, September 8th, we want to let you know you want to plan to be here at the church by 7.45 a.m. The vans will be leaving promptly at 8 o'clock, so you don't want to miss that, especially if you are signed up and paid. Um, and those who have not yet paid, uh, we are looking to receive those funds today if possible, as um, we have already sent monies off for the group. So that would be wonderful. You can see myself or Larry Legand in the back. And um, we just look forward to a great day up on the mountain that day. At this time, those who are uh, receiving tithes and offerings, if you can prepare and we will get ready to give. Lord, we thank you for another day. Thank you that you are in this place today with us. And Lord, now it's our opportunity to give back to you with our tithes and our offerings. We pray that you would bless each gift and bless the giver. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as you're preparing your gifts and giving, we would like to invite Brother John to come and speak. He has a great word for us on God, creation, and the universe this afternoon. Welcome him as he comes. If you uh, have an opportunity to look at the uh, Living Proof uh, presentations that are made on YouTube. The one that's dated August the 3rd was the last time I spoke. And in the evening message, which is what's online, I mentioned uh, these two passages of scripture that we're looking at today from Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 9. And at the time that uh, we were in the discussion of what we were talking about that night, I 
happen to mention that if you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, the statement that God makes to Adam and Eve after they have been created is that they would be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Now that's from, as some would say, the authorized version, the King James. The King James Version is not the only one that uses that word, but uh, a lot of the modern translations don't use the word replenish. If you look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, you will find basically the same statement being made to Noah and his family. God saved eight, and he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Now, it's interesting, I would look at that and I would say, well, that makes sense because the earth was full of people when God destroyed the earth and he only saved the eight. But who in the world was here that God would say to Adam and Eve, replenish the earth? Weren't they the first ones? Well, that just opens up a whole bunch of questions. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God, sled, God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. He didn't make the sun until verse 4, or day 4. Where'd the light come from? Isn't that fun to think about? <laughs> There's a whole bunch of stuff in God's Word that you have to sit there and say to yourself, I don't understand this, but I accept it because God's word says it this way. That's right. yeah. That's right. The word replenish is not in your notes here. I just want to talk about this really briefly. The word that is used there also means to refill. But it also means to fill. In the American Standard translation of the Bible, it uses the word replenish. However, if you have the New King James, the NIV, the Amplified, and I could list another 25 versions of the Bible. None of them use the word replenish. All of them use the word fill. In both cases, God said to Noah and he said to Adam and Eve, fill the earth with people. And that's what God was asking him to do. Now, I just briefly want to say about this concept because it's such a big deal now in this crazy world that we live in and we get hammered with the mass media that's gone berserk. Jesus said, broad is the way and wide is the gate, many there be that go therein, down the wrong pathway. Straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leads the right way. So number one, I can absolutely guarantee you that when I talk about something that's scriptural, we're in the minority. I don't care. God's word is supreme. He is sovereign. I am always wrong and he is always right. And the sooner that the world gets a hold of that understanding and truth, the better off it will be as we are. The first thing you got to recognize in order to be saved is that you need a savior. You're wrong, and everything you think is wrong, and you need somebody to straighten you out, and that's why only God 
is right. And he said in Isaiah, my ways, my thoughts are above yours. Even the best of us and the most mature saints of us still need him and his thoughts, his direction, his guidance, his salvation. And you cannot be a disciple unless you humbly submit to learning. The word disciple means to be a learner. When you think you have garnered all there is to know, you no longer are a disciple, so be careful. <laughs> we still are in the learning stages of our life. So I wanted to say all of that to come back to this one point. In this world, we are constantly hammered with the limitation and the shortages of those things that sustain life. The earth is running out of stuff. Hollywood produces movie after movie talking about things that are dwindling and having to look into space and, and all of the reason why they left the earth and created these satellite places to live is because the earth was running out of natural resources and you naughty human beings are all to blame. Well, I have found that in the time that I have studied scripture that we start running out of natural resources when we rebel and disobey God. He turns off the tap, so to speak. We get droughts, we get floods, we have tornadoes and hurricanes. Things go sideways on us as punishment to get us to get back in line and serve God the way we should. When the nation, this was Israel, this constant cycle with Israel, getting involved in idolatry, they would repent, they would come back to God, and then all of a sudden now the bumper crops magically appear. The rains come when they're supposed to. The seeds blossom, the flowers bloom. Everything is running like it should be to an overabundance of natural resources beyond all that we can consume. I am a firm believer that if we have seven and a half billion people on earth, that if we serve God the way we should serve God, this earth would sustain the life of 10 billion people, of 12 billion people. Those who are obedient are going to be blessed and they will be blessed with natural resources. So that's my argument against all of the nonsense about well, the, uh, <laughs> global warming, climate change. I heard a guy this last week said a certain city in North Dakota had reached a 116 degree temperature and broke all records for heat on a certain day in July, 116 degrees. The last time they had that was in 1894 when they reached 115. And in July this year, they blamed climate change. The reason why they had 116 degree temperature. In 1894, when they reached 115, they blamed summer. <laughs> It's hot in summer. 1979, during the presidential primaries, Ronald Reagan declared the unthinkable. He said that he had creationist sympathies. Whether this helped him gain the presidency of the United States, we will never know. But it certainly helped the whole Western world to realize that from now on, creationism would have to be taken more seriously. Ever since then, the public has been subjected to a barrage of books and articles and television programs and movies about evolution and creation. Oh, we can't let that creation talk get too far. We have to drown it out. Uh, this is not in your notes, and I hope that I don't get too far off astray throughout this lesson, but let me point out the, the, the book uh, 1984 by Orwell talks about big brother government controlling everything and tightening the grips and not letting you have the ability to think or to make decisions on your own they do everything for you that is one concept of government controlling people however the opposite was also promoted by somebody just as agnostic and atheistic as Orwell was, was Aldous Huxley in his book, Brave New World. He talked also about a godless society 
but a godless society that produced information of glut of knowledge and teachings to the point where you have analysis paralysis. You just can't consume it all. And in the process, truth was drowned out because of all the other tangential voices that were going on. In Orwell's idea, he marginalized truth and wouldn't allow it to be spoken. In Aldous's, Aldous Uxley's world, it was drowned out with a, a bunch of information. We have both of those things going on right now. Both of those things are happening in our world right now. I will be referring to three books uh, in this discussion today. One is the one I quoted here at the beginning, Alan Hayward's Creation and Evolution. I'll also be referring to John Lennox's book, Seven Days That Divide the World. And if you look at page six, you'll, you'll find all of these that are listed. And another book I'll be referring to is Robert Jastrow's book, God and the Astronomers. Now those are the three books that I've taken most of my information from. And as I present this topic to you this morning, I want to tell you first of all, that I'm going to be speaking to you from an approach concerning scripture. I'm going to be talking mostly about what God's word says, and I will be talking to you about textual criticism. Today's message is a thinking, teaching message. And I am going to tell you right off the bat that if you listen to this and you fall asleep, you owe me $5. Because <laughs> I just heard from Al that he has a hard time sleeping. So buddy, if you listen to this and this helps you sleep, you owe me five bucks. <laughs> The second half of this teaching, because I end at the top of page four, in what I would refer to as the, the biblical message textual portion. And the reason why I conclude at the top of page four is because tonight when I teach, I only have a half hour to teach, pretty much. Today I've got over an hour, so I've got both. I, I not only have the biblical textual position to talk to you about, but at, starting on page four, Specifics of science and scripture and the eternal cosmos, this is apologetics information. This is what would be taught for a group of people who want to contend with evolutionists. And in essence, from the top of page four to the end of this presentation, this is all apologetics. This is an appendix to the lesson that I'm sharing with you today. So the first portion of this we're going to be centering on the Bible, and then in the second portion, the focus is on scientific investigation and how that aligns with our belief in God as creator, okay? My first heading is Young Earth, Old Earth. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that concept, but the there is a whole school of philosophy and teaching concerning the Bible that believes that the earth started about 6,000 years ago. We believe 2,000 years ago Jesus was here, but 4,000 be years before Jesus came is when Adam and Eve were created, the earth was created, the heavens were created, and the creation story that we have in Genesis 1 is the story of that creation. Six thousand years ago, 4,000 B.C., 4,000 years before Christ. That is the young earth group of teaching, okay? The old earth group of teaching believes something happened between Genesis 1, 1, and Genesis 1, 2. God created the heavens and the earth in the eons in the past, yeah, 20 million, 60 million years ago, entirely possible. But something happened that destroyed the earth that is described in verse 2. The earth was without form and void. And we're going to be looking at specific words. Genesis 1, 1 to Genesis 2, 3 
gives us the creation of heavens and earth, the six days of organizing and creating life, life forms, and it ends with the creation of man, and God rests on the seventh day from his creating. Verse 5 says, and the evening and the morning were the first day. What is a day? The Hebrew word is yom, which means day. We consider a 24 hours, daytime and nighttime together to be a day. In John chapter 11, verse 9, Jesus said, are there not 12 hours in a day? Not 24. He said 12. The word Jesus used for day in the New Testament, Greek, as well as in English, means daytime. So he was saying, are there not 12 hours in daytime? In Genesis, we find that the word day includes both evening and morning, as you and I would consider it. That means in creation, 24 hours equals a day. What is further not in your notes this morning, isn't it interesting at verse 5 that he starts off with evening? He doesn't start off with midnight. Neither does he start off with sunrise. He starts off with sundown. Sundown begins the day. And in Jewish analysis of our calendar and years, a day always starts with sundown. Passover began with sundown the day before Jesus was crucified. Jesus was crucified in the daytime of Passover day, almost 16 hours later from when Passover started. So he celebrated Passover meal in the evening and was crucified on Passover day in the daytime. And then at the end of that Passover day, it started immediately with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and he had to be buried in haste because the Feast of Unleavened Bread was the day that the Jewish people, the Israelites, got out of Egypt. And the day of getting out of Egypt was more important than the Passover. They could crucify somebody on Passover, but boy, you don't have nobody crucified on the day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The next day, starting at sundown, and that's why he was buried in haste in a borrowed tomb. And why, ladies, the women showed up on the first day of the week, Sunday, with the proper burial equipment to properly bury Jesus the way he should have been because those men didn't do it right on the day that they buried him. <laughs> they did it quick and they did it wrong. Now, how many ladies have, are familiar with a husband doing something a little bit too quick and dirty and he didn't do it right? <laughs> Sorry, I got off base on that one. These terms and verses not only divide the difference between those who believe in God as creator and those who do not believe in God as creator, but it also divides believers who believe in God as creator. Both Jews and, Gentile and Christians, Jews and Christians are divided over the concept of a young earth and an old earth teaching. Young earth adherents believe that the material earth was universe, were all created 6,000 years ago. The six days of creation are literal. They claim Charles Darwin's theory of progressive evolution of all things over eons of time is wrong. The gradual development of material things into living things is a denial of God and promotes atheism. Therefore, believers who promote an old earth are accommodating and modif uh, modified version of evolution in order to appease atheistic society. That's the viewpoint. Old Earth adherents believe there is a large gap of time between Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and verse 2. Something happened to ruin the Earth as it is described in verse 2. Repeated scientific studies show that our Earth, our universe, is multiple millions of years old. Not only investigation of this Earth, but also investigation of the moon and investigation of Mars as we have been able to look at the material that it's made out of. They have repeatedly come back and said, these are evidences of a universe that is multiple millions of years old. Those studies base their conclusions largely on what is considered the current rate of decay 
Material things projected backwards as they decay show us a point of beginning. However, the new earth proponents say that isn't necessarily true. Everything as it is today started with the flood of Noah, so you're using time and decay that started with Noah's flood and not pre-flood information, and the rate of decay before the flood was totally different. Additionally, God could have, if he wanted to, he could have made the universe old when he made it 6,000 years ago. Because didn't he make Adam and Eve as mature adults and not babies? Well, he could have made the universe 20 million years old if he wanted to on the same time. So these arguments, as you see, go back and forth, and you just have to choose which one you like and go with it. Help yourself. Honestly, you're in good company either way. But it would, would be silly to try and argue one side or the other side because there are information and there's, there's good, conclusive studies that prove both are right. And both are wrong. Genesis 1-1 tells us there was a beginning. God created all material things, the earth and the universe and all living creatures on earth. The Jews have identified three heavens, the atmosphere above the earth, heaven number one, the universe and the stars and the galaxies, that's heaven number two. And then lastly, the invisible residence of our God is the third eternal heaven. God transcends all things, living and non-living. He doesn't need us. We need Him. A Bible teacher once said, God is the only being in existence. The reason for whose existence lies within Himself. Everything and everyone else, including angels, owe their existence to God. Derek Prince once taught the following, God did not create all things, then take a holiday. He remains solidly in control, master and owner of everything. He began all things, and in Him all things will come to a conclusion. Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega. Omega. Everything began with Him. Everything's going to end with Him. Revelation 4.11, For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. There's another translation that says, They were created that way because that's the way you wanted them. Friends, the best reason for everything, that God wants it that way. God wanted the universe the way that it is. He wanted us the way we are. There is no higher reason or purpose for me and the things of my life than this, that God wants it that way. My declaration is, God, all your ways and words are perfect. And God has never done anything unrighteous. Unquote from Derek Prince. Genesis 1-1 has several important truths. Number one, since God is the source of all that exists, angels, mankind, and nature, are, and they are not self-existent. They owe their existence to God. Number two, everything that exists is good when it stays in right relationship with God. And number three, all life and creation can have meaning and purpose. God designed it that way. God is sovereign over all of His creation, even after the fall. The divisive words are in verse 2. Genesis 1-2 in the New King James Version says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In the Amplified Version, it says, The earth was without form and empty waste, and darkness was upon the face of the great deep. The Spirit of God was moving, now check this, hovering and brooding over the face of the waters. In the message, now not everybody likes the message, but I kind of like the way he says it here. So if you don't like the message, please bear with me. <laughs> the earth was a soup of nothingness and inky blackness. I kind of like the way he says that. God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. And let me tell you that the word in the Hebrew means exactly that. The Holy Spirit was brooding over the destruction of the earth. In verse 2. Without form and void, the question that divides. God, did God create earth as a desolate wasteland or was it destroyed? 
Verse 2 has created a division between believers. Just like verse 1 has divided the world, some in verse 2 explains the earth's creation, others say it's a recreation, a restoration. If God first made the earth without form and void and empty, did he do the same thing with the universe? Empty, formless, and void. The meaning of verse 2 is not a moral philosophical question. It's a science question. Why was the earth devoid of design? Why was there an inky darkness? Why did the Holy Spirit brood over the earth like a mother bird grieving over her demolished nest? The word that is used there, brood or hovering, is Strong's word H922, which is void. And that word in Hebrew is bohu. Now, I didn't say boohoo. It's bohu, okay? Which means a wasted emptiness and void. Isaiah 34, 11 says the earth was in a state of emptiness and confusion. It kind of parallels that, doesn't it? But may I say, if you will notice, or if you ever do deep research, the Greek Septuagint version of the Old Testament, which was written 246 years before Christ, translates this word bohu into a rarely used Greek word in literature, akastas kebastos. Isn't that a handlebar of a name? Please don't ask me to say it twice. Just the length of the word tells you that we have another picture word here. Oxford's Dictionary by Henry Little and Robert Scott Greek English Lexicon shows that this Greek word means this, unwrought, unformed, chaos, unmade, unbuilt, unconstructed. Do you follow what that says? Something was constructed, something was formed, something was built, and now it is unbuilt. They say that this word only appears once in Scripture, and it's here, Genesis 1-2. But it also appears in the apocryphal book called the Book of Enoch in chapter 21, where Enoch refers to the word there, and it's translated chaotic. He said, I proceeded to where things were chaotic, and I saw that there was something horrible, a place chaotic, uses the same Hebrew or Greek word two times. Now the reason for all this research is to show you that the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, which was translated by 70 Hebrew scholars, Hebrew to Greek, chose a unique word and an unusual word to describe what the earth looked like in verse 2. It had become destroyed. It had become chaotic in its condition. Now, I don't want to offend anybody, but if I may say, and I'm sure there's going to be scholars that will scoff at this, who are you? Okay, I'm nobody. I'm just a guy that likes to be a good Sunday school teacher. That's that's my my level of expertise. That's that's it. That's all I want to do. I want to be a good Sunday school teacher. I'm not a doctor. But I have to ask the question here. 250 years before Christ, and we know that there's at least 15 books in the Old Testament that are named that, that we don't have copies of. Don't you think that those 250 Hebrew scholars who knew both Hebrew and Greek fluently, backwards and forwards, probably knew more about what words should be used here than you do today? If you're not humbly submitted to the idea that you as a scholar in the 20th, 21st century don't know as much as these guys did two centuries before Christ, and I suggest that you get another grip on your humility. We are all learners. These men chose a word that said the earth was unmade from something that it was made perfect. In Alan Hayward's book, Creation and Evolution, on page 169, he talks about the often used parenthesis structure of biblical texts. Remember, neither Hebrew or Greek used punctuation marks, which English uses. And then now I have a quote. You notice that in your notes? There ain't no quotes in Hebrew and Greek. They never had any. 
but English does, and we also have parenthesis marks. Quote, this is from Alan Hayward, Parentheses are used to insert a separate secondary thought into a passage or a sentence in such a way that the sentence makes complete sense when you read it without the parenthetical remark. An example is found in Acts chapter 1 verse 15, quote, In those days Peter stood up among the brethren, parenthesis, the company of persons was about 120, in parenthesis, and said, do you remember what he said? Brethren, you think that these boys are drunk? It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Nobody gets drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. No, this is a fulfillment of the prophecy from Joel that in the last days God would pour out His Spirit on all flesh and your young men would have dreams and your old men would have visions and your, your women would be, your young lads, your young lasses would be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what he talked about. But you notice he, he puts in parenthesis here. Oh, by the way, there were 120 there. In parenthesis. There's many examples of this in the Bible in this same grammatical structure giving a brief description of something that's being discussed in the middle of a narrative. Paul frequently used this style of writing in his letters. I've referenced it a lot of times when I'm studying the book of Romans or, or, or if I should say I'm teaching it. And the book of Ephesians is filled with these little parenthetical remarks all the way through the entire book. And, it, and you would get lost if you didn't understand what was being uh, formulated here in the style of writing that Pete, uh, Paul had and the other New Testament writers. And may I say something else? Chapters and verses are not ordained by God. Okay? Chapters and verses were made up by men. And quite frankly, they mess up the Bible. There are a number of places I could take you to for examples to show you that somebody put a chapter uh, division right in the middle of a sentence. It was, it was not inspired by the Holy Spirit to put in chapters and verses. It was done after the Bible was printed. And quite frankly, the story goes that one of the publishers in Paris had a Bible on his lap and he was riding his donkey on the way home and he was making these little tick marks in his Bible and they went back and published it and said, here's your chapters and verses. And then when they published the Geneva Bible in Geneva, Switzerland, that was produced by the disciples of John Knox and John Calvin, they all got together and published a Bible in English. They used those same divisions that the guy came up with in Paris. And then the King James Version adopted the same divisions that the Geneva Bible used. Then so we got them, we're stuck with them now. There's <laughs> nothing you can do about pushing a string uphill. It is tough to try and explain to people those chapters and verses are bogus. Sorry. Now, let me ask you ladies, if your husband wrote you a sweetheart letter and put chapters and verses in it, would you box his ears? <laughs> I mean, God wrote us a love letter. He didn't put chapters and verses in it. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to get off my soapbox and get back to the study. <laughs> The grammatical structure of creation, Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, is separated into three phrases. These three phrases are first a fiat. That's not talking about a car. It's talking about a statement. It's talking about a declaration, which is followed by a specific creation. The third phrase is, and there was evening and morning, was the certain day. Day one, day two, day three. The second phrase is in the middle. That's all parenthesis. It's describing the creation. When we understand the structure, we can understand the first phrase becomes a creative fiat. We have five of them in the first week of creation. On the sixth day, we don't have the fiat of let there be man. We have let there be light. We have let there be day. We have let there be stars. We have let there be animals. We have let there be grass. Let there be this. Let there be. Well, when he said, when it comes down to making man, God made man himself. Not by words, but by hand. This indicates a very personal involvement by God on the two days, day six and day seven which is not seen in any of the other five days. When we understand this grammatical structure, we 
find that the word beginning in Genesis 1-1 does not mean that it took place on the first day. By separating the beginning from day one, it leaves this age of universe indetermined. Now I'm going to skip over this note because I repeat myself later and I apologize I didn't do this correctly here. But I'm going to jump down to the next statement. Let me add. When the discussion about the end of creation comes up, now, when I talk prophecy, and I talk about the soon return of Jesus, and I talk about all of the things that are going to happen in the book of Revelation, and Christ is coming back, and I also talk about the rapture that the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord, and there shall we be forever with the Lord. Hallelujah. I can count. Just as much, I can, I tell you, just as much as I believe the sun is going to show up tomorrow morning and peek its beautiful head over the horizon and say, hi, John, it's daytime. I can guarantee you somebody in the audience is going to say, yeah, but no man knows the day or the hour. Well, three cheers for you. And that usually slams the door on any other biblical prophetic teaching. Well, let me ask you, brother, you believe in... No man knows the day or the hour when God's going to end the world. How come you have such a, a, a dogmatic belief on when God made it? You don't understand and you don't believe and nobody understands when God is going to end it. No man knows the day or the hour when it's going to be over. How do you know the day and the hour when it all started? So how can you be so dogmatic about young earth? Just a question for you. We shouldn't read into Scripture things that it doesn't say, and we shouldn't take out of Scripture the things that it says. That's what I wanted to point out next. Up to now, we've been talking about narrative of Genesis. Now let's turn to the science. Biblical scholars tell us the Bible is not a history book, but what it says about history is 100% accurate. Anybody ever heard of the name Sir Henry Lyard? One of the greatest archaeologists of the 1850s. No, no, no. Okay. Um, I study interesting stuff. I think it's interesting. My wife doesn't. And obviously, you never heard of Henry Lyer. You don't probably think it's very interesting <laughs> either. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I mean, let me go on. There is at least three. British scholars that helped originate the Museum of History in Britain, who when they were investigating the existence of lands and people and cities and nations in the historic past, would use the book of Luke to help them find stuff. Because Luke was the greatest ancient historian alive. And every time that these fellas got together and said, no, the Bible's wrong, the Bible was proved right. And every time it was proved right, they found it in the book of Luke. When I say that the Bible is not a history book, but it is 100% accurate when it talks about history, the book of Luke stands head and shoulders above many historians. The same thing can be said about science in the Bible. It is not a science book, but what it says about science is 100% accurate. The fact, this fact is what brought Hugh Ross into becoming a converted Christian. I don't know. Hugh Ross? No, okay. Hugh Ross wrote, wrote a book called The Fingerprint of God when he looked at the universe, and it was an outstanding book in the, in the 80s. And it is one of the greatest apologetic books on creation that's in print. And he was an agnostic, so to speak, from Canada. And he looked at every religion. He looked at Buddhism. He looked at the teachings of Confucius. He looked at other uh, another religion that comes out of the Middle East. <laughs> He looked at Judaism and he landed on Christianity. And he said, 
the Christian teaching that comes not only out of the Old Testament but the New Testament that explains it is the greatest scientific book on planet Earth as far as a religious book. He said, I will become a Christian. He was a, he was a doctorate in science and he left it all in order to promote Christianity. <clears throat> Some teachers like John Walton in his book, The Lost World of Genesis, say, don't force the text into saying more than the author intended it to say. However, the opposite can also be said. Don't force the text into saying less than the author intended it to say. Let us, what, you know what I'm talking about here? I don't know if you're familiar with this text proofing in, in homiletics when you were taught to become a minister. Don't cherry pick verses out of the Bible to prove your point. You got an ax to grind, go grind it someplace else. Let God's word speak for God's word. It doesn't need your help, you need its help. And there are so many preachers that get involved and here's this text that says something I want said. And then they will push it and they grow off on it into error. This, I told you this was a teaching class. Okay, it's not a sermon today. It's not going to make you shout, but it'll keep you on the straight and narrow. <laughs> Let us make this abundantly clear. The Bible has always stated in unequivocal language that there was a beginning. John Lennox in his book, Seven Days That Divide the World, quote, The very same emphasis of God speaking that we find in Genesis is also found at the beginning of the Gospel of John. It says, in the beginning was the Word. All things were made through Him, John 1, 1 and 1, 3. The disciple John used the Greek word logos, which conveys ideas of word, command, and information. That word is a declaration, is a command. It is a fiat, the, the greatest of all sources of expository wording coming from God Almighty came from the lips of Jesus Christ in the creation of all things that are. Paul says there is nothing made that is made that was not made by Him, Jesus Christ. He is the source of the words that were spoken that created all things and put them into existence. It's Christ. He is the Logos. And the there one, one colloquial term when you have somebody that has the last word on a subject, remember how people talk about, uh, what was that, tax people? When, when uh, such and so talks, everybody stops and listens. Do anybody remember that commercial? Uh, anyway. <laughs> um, that, that, was, that is Jesus. He is the last word on every single subject. Now when he was here on earth and he, and he had the last word on something, people would look at him, but he's a know-it-all. No one else just shut the door. I'm right and everybody else is wrong. That was Jesus. That was Jesus. I'm right and everybody else is wrong. That's logos. That's what that word means. The greatest obstacle in the concept and theory of Darwinism is that everything created, there is information. This information could not have evolved. It had to be inserted into all living things by someone who created it. When we look at a restaurant menu, science can tell you what the paper is made out of, what the ink is made out of. They can probably tell you the source of the materials that created the paper and the ink. But what they cannot tell you is that that ink is arranged into the form of letters and that those letters are arranged into a, a form of providing information. It's not happenstance. It had to have been put together by an intelligent designer who made that menu in such a fashion that you as an intelligent being could understand that when you look at that menu, you understand that your cheeseburger is going to cost $12 and it comes with bottomless steak fries. <laughs> that is information. And information is built into every living thing. Every living thing. I did this on August 3rd. I, if you take a look at your thumb, nobody has the thumbprint that you do. I did this last time. I'm doing it again. Get ready. 
You look at that seven and a half billion people on the planet do not have that thumbprint and yours too. You are somebody. <laughs> Scripture is concerned with something that is arguably far more important than science. The most often asked questions are, who am I? Where did I, how did I get here? Why am I here? Where am I going? When people come to a loss of their self-worth, exasperated and consider committing suicide, they have lost this and they have not been informed of this. You are special. None of the questions that can be answered by scientific analysis in a laboratory, these answers must come to the heart from a heart, the heart of God. If the Bible is right, if a supreme intelligent designer made a special place for a special creation, then just how special are you? Isaiah tells us in chapter 43, verse 1, Thus says the Lord, who created you, he who formed you, says to you, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Beloved, God picked you. You are chosen. You are special. Now, that's where I'm going to end tonight. But we have 25 minutes to go. You guys ready? Let's keep going. The specifics of science and scripture, the eternal cosmos. Carl Sagan, narrated, narrator of the PBS series special, Cosmos, he said at the very beginning of this really elaborate presentation on TV, he said, quote, the cosmos is all that is, or was, or ever will be. What's he talking about? The stars, the universe. He continues, our feeblest contemplations of the cosmos steer us. There is a tingling in the spine, a catch in the voice, a faint sensation as if a distant memory of falling from a height. We know we are approaching the greatest of mysteries. Are you excited? Well, I don't have the music that he had, and I don't have the picture of the ocean waves rolling, and I don't have the picture of the Milky Way that he had, and, and kind of wow you with stuff, but that uh, yeah, doesn't do anything for me. But this is how he began his atheistic Darwin and his evolutionary teachings on PBS with your tax money to promote <laughs> the teachings of Charles Darwin. He later says concerning humanity and our evolution from uh, material things that you and I are made of star stuff. Uh, that, make, that make you feel special? <laughs> I will talk a little bit more about that later in this. Uh, what I'm going to tell the evening uh, Living Proof people is when I get down to this one, I said, take it home and read it. <laughs> that I'm not going to have time to teach it. One of my um, most interesting books that I have in my library is written by Robert Jastrow, who is a Jewish agnostic. Surprise. He's, he's an astrophysicist. He, he knows there's a God out there, but he doesn't think God's personal. He, is, he was, he's passed away now, but he was a very good friend of Dennis Prager, if you're familiar with him. Dennis Prager was the one who mentioned him and his book that I went right out and bought. He condemned and criticized other astronomical physicists, leaders in astronomy, 
throughout the world condemned them and criticized them in his book, God and the Astronomers, written in 1970. Since the 1920s, he says in his book, there has been a scientific school of teaching that the universe is expanding. I don't know if you're familiar with this or not. It was from the 1920s. These findings were based on the analysis of Einstein's calculations concerning time and space, which he is famous for, his theory of relativity. That's what he was talking about, that time is a fourth dimension. And these intelligent men got behind it and, and investigated it, followed his conclusions, and were, believe it or not, at Mount Wilson, just right over here, at the Mount Wilson Observatory, watching and looking at the stars and the universe, and came away with this statement, the universe is getting bigger. It isn't stationary. One of those that was there was Dr. Edwin Hubble, the one that they named the telescope after. You got all these pictures of this guy. Uh, the whole telescope was named after this guy. Other scientists there at Mount Wilson Observatory had found that the universe is expanding at a rate of one million miles per hour. Isn't that fabulous? Fascinating. Never heard this stuff before. Back in the 1920s, they promoted this. They wondered if they could reverse this expansion. If, hey, hey, if it's going out, could we make it go backwards in our calculations? What would we find when we do? Well, what they found was what is popularly referred to as the Big Bang. They said everything went backwards in time to a moment when it all exploded simultaneously at some point in the past. Robert Jastrow considered himself to be an agnostic when it came to religious matters, but he said the following, quote, however, I am fascinated by some strange developments going on in astronomy, partly because of their religious implications and partly because of the peculiar reactions of my colleagues. Every time he brought up the idea that there was an intelligent designer, that there was a God behind this, they blanched, went crazy, and changed the subject. And he thought, this is fascinating. They really don't follow the science. What have we been, what's been shoved down our throats for the last three years? Follow the science, you've got to wear a mask. Follow the science, you've got to protect yourself. Follow your science, get a Q-tip shoved up your nose to find out if you're sick or not. Now that they got the monkey, monkey pox, they're going to stick a banana up your nose to find out. I'm sorry. I don't mean to belittle this stuff, but when a guy comes across and says he's following his teachings to the ultimate conclusion and doesn't have a predetermined mindset, he doesn't have an axe to grind, then I'll believe him. But every single one of these guys come up with Darwin's right. No, he ain't. There was a beginning. First is the universe had a beginning. Second, it had it happened under circumstances that seemed to make it impossible to find out what force or forces brought the world into being. These quotes are from Robert Jastrow. Third, was it as the Bible says that the Lord in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth. This is an astronomical physicist in the 1970s who followed science to its proper conclusion. There is no denial. The universe began and there was somebody who started it. He said, we have been aware, 1970, he said, quote, we have been aware for 50 years that we live in an expanding universe in which all the galaxies around us are moving apart from us and from one another at enormous speeds. The universe is blowing up before our eyes as if it were we are witnessing the aftermath of a giant explosion. If we trace the motions of the outward moving galaxies and go backward in time, we find that everything comes together at one point 15 to 20 billion years ago. A single point. When you read this message that we have from Peter, when he talks about all of the earth and all of the universe would melt and be consumed with a great noise. Does that sound like a big bang to you? 
if the universe and all that exists that has been created is going to disappear with a big bang, maybe it started with a big bang. Just saying. Jastro challenged all scientific societies if they truly do follow the science as they claim. If so, then why did, why not admit this clear and undeniable evidence that the universe had an explosive beginning? He suggests it's because these scientists don't want to admit that there was a beginning, that there was a Big Bang. They don't want to even consider the universe is not eternal because they would have to admit a beginning which infers that someone started it, which means that there was an intelligent designer, which means there is a God. And they don't want to go down that road, so they lie. And our universities and our governments are filled with bald-faced, look you in the eye and lie like a rug liars who have an agenda and have an ax to grind and don't want to admit there's a creator and we are responsible to him and we will answer to him one day and they don't want to Jastro concludes the universe was caused and the one who caused it is God that's Robert Jastro's book God and the Astronomers now, what about this earth that we live on? What's so uniquely special about that? Guillermo Gonzalez in his book, Privileged Planet, by the way, there's a movie on the same thing. He argued that the earth is located in the best possible position to study the universe. He says this was not accidental. Have, are, are you familiar with the pinwheel? You know, little kids, they have a pinwheel. And that's what the, that, if you could look down on uh, Milky Way, you would see that it's shaped like a pinwheel. There's there's globs of sections that are filled with stars and all kinds of stuff all the way around. And then in between those pinwheel wheels, those solid parts, there's a spot where if there was a planet there and there were intelligent beings there, they could look through all the stuff and they could see the universe with telescopes, with radiology, with amazing electronic equipment. They could look at the world and the universe beyond millions of miles away. There is. It's called Earth. Put in the most perfect, precise location in the universe to study the universe. He says there are over 20 chemical elements contained in the universe which are so finely tuned as to make life possible only in one place, Earth. Now, recently, my brother-in-law, who the last time I had a chance to talk to him face to face, he said, John, you're the last brother-in-law I have alive. Take care of yourself. I've had six, and you're the last one. Two weeks later, he had a massive heart attack. We almost lost him three times. They uh, looked at him and said, he's not healthy enough to operate on, but we're going to go in and we're going to give him a triple bypass because if we don't do this, he's going to die right here, sitting in this room. They took him in. They saved him. They saved his life. He's home now. He's home. He's taking 11 different prescriptions to help him with his heart, antibiotics, keep the pace going, keep the energy going. 11 different chemicals are floating through his body that are specifically prescribed for his condition right now to keep him healthy. Can you not understand that there is a God Almighty who looked at us and knew that there were 20 chemicals that we needed in order to live and move and have our being? He set it all up before he even made us because the earth and the universe as we read it were perfectly formed on the fourth day of creation and man was created on the sixth day. On the fifth day, he made all the animals and all the birds and all the fish of the sea so they could perfectly live here on this planet. 
And then he made man to be in charge of all of it. The theory of evolution from Charles Darwin in his book referred to as the origin of the species, which is actually a shortened title. It's much longer. That Carl Sagan referred to in his Cosmos and said we were made out of star stuff. This is a, rep a repetition of the theory of evolution. Charles Darwin wrote his book in 1859, and it shook the world. J.P. Moreland, who was a, a teacher down at Biola University here in Southern California, said there wouldn't be as much controversy today if Darwin had titled his book How Different Species Evolve Over Time. But what he said was, this is the origin of species. He stuck his neck out and said, this is how we all evolved from stuff. Evolution teaches time plus matter stuff plus chance. Happenstance has created all things that exist. Isn't that lovely? What a wonderful thought. You're just a matter of luck. The luck of chemicals floating around in mud. What is not discussed is how this material stuff, this dirt, this star stuff, can progressively change and suddenly produce the spark of life. How do you change a dirt clod into a kitty cat? <laughs> you can't. What is also not discussed or explained is how or why there is a vast amount of information contained in every living thing. Michael Behe is a microchemist. In his book, The Darwin's Black Box, in 1996, he was studying the reproductive engines that exist inside the living cell. Now, this was one of the things that Darwin could not explain. He did not understand the cell. The human cell is filled with all kinds of living machines that help you produce and live. Michael Behe said, every living cell contains different machines for repair and reproduction of the human body. None of these machines could have evolved through trial and error over time. Every single one of them had to be working flawlessly from the point of inception in order for us to exist. We could not exist if it were not for those things that are in our cell. Now, I don't know if you can see it in there. I got a howie. I, 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 had a, I had a wrestling match with a metal gate, and I lost. <laughs> and I get a big nasty thing right here. It just was profusely pouring out blood. Della got that brown powder that they have for, you know, they poured that on there to make it clot, and then she put a Band-Aid on it. And this is about the fourth day I've been wearing a Band-Aid now with that thing on there, and I've got some polysporum to help it all come together. I got a big nasty, ugly gash underneath that thing. But you know what? It's healing. Why is it healing? Because of these machines that are inside the living cell that when you have a boo-boo, it's going to go right to work and start fixing you. And when those things stop working like they're supposed to, when we <laughs> get a little snow on the roof, <laughs> we have to go, to go see somebody and get some extra chemicals put into our system to help us get over this. Every living cell contains your own personal DNA, a vast amount of information. Stephen C. Meyer in his book called Signature in the Cell, with the help of Jonathan Wells and Philip Johnson and Dean Kenyon and William Dembski and Michael Behe, they all argue for an intelligent designer. We are not just a mass of indifferent matter or material. Our bodies contain an enormous amount of information in our DNA. It's the information we need to fix our injuries. Stephen Meyer says this information could not have evolved, unquote. When we are injured or our DNA instructs our cells to fix and repair us, Francis Crick, who was the co-founder of the DNA in 1954, he said the amount of information that's contained in one cell of your DNA could fill the encyclopedia of over 100 volumes with each volume containing at least 1,300,000 words. 100 volumes, each volume, 1,300,000 words are in your cell describing who you are and what you are. Each cell of our body contains a complete copy of our DNA. God made you thumb body. 
God made you special. And he loves you very much. Michael Behe said Darwin could not un have understood the human cell in the 80s, 1850s, as we do today. His theory of progressive evolution completely falls apart with our understanding of the human cell today. His, his philosophy of survival of the fittest was made famous in the fifth edition of Our Origin of the Species, and that theory suggests that organisms that best adjust to their environment survive. It's a model. The results of Darwinism are, you're an accident of nature. Nature is more important than people. Humanity is progressive, progressing towards a perfect human. Some people are useless eaters, which is what the Nazis said about the Jews. There is no afterlife, continuing with Darwin's ideas. More, whoever stands in the way of what's best for me must either be silenced or eliminated. Get out of the way. And that all comes from the book from Richard Weichart, who is a professor of uh, sociology and history at uh, Stanislaus County in, the, in, in uh, California, who wrote the book From Darwin to Hitler. He came back and said, Darwinism didn't create Hitler, but Hitler could not have succeeded without Darwinism. Follow the science. If people are useless blobs of flesh, mistakes of nature, then how can mass genocide or abortion possibly be wrong? Interestingly enough, at the Nuremberg trials, German leaders claimed that they were following and practicing the same progressive theories of Darwinism that were and are being taught in Britain and in the United States. They argued, the men at the Nuremberg trials, the Nazis, argued, this is what your collegiate teaching looks like in real life. We lived it. We lived it. Bless, bless, listen to me. There's coming a man on the stage of history that we refer to as the beast or the antichrist. He is going to be the epitome of this, and he will silence everybody who disagrees with him, and he will be the cause of millions of people dying for his philosophies and teachings. He will be, he'll make Hitler look like a schoolboy. That's where this world is headed. And it's headed in that direction on a downhill pool, as my grandma used to say. Information in every living cell and the inexplicable fine-tuning of the universe are irrefutable evidence of an intelligent designer behind all things living and non-living. We exist because God wanted it that way. That's the end of the lesson. Now, take away with you the understanding that just as extraordinary and vast and unbelievably intricate is the human cell that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that through his son the world might be saved he is an intelligent being who wants to have a relationship with you. And his joy is that you want to have a relationship with him. He loves you. And he wants you to live with him forever. And that's why Jesus came. Amen. You are the body. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this teaching, for this message, for the instruction. We thank you for all of these people who so much smarter than I will ever be put together these thoughts and these words and have stood the ground, proclaimed God is our creator and he has made us individually for himself and desires that we would follow and serve him and have a relationship with him. We ask you, Lord, that you will bless each one that didn't make it out today and for those that came, that you will remind them daily of how much you care and everything that you have done to make life possible for us 
and how every day is orchestrated by you, every moment is a design by you, every breath that we take is a blessing from you, and that we live and move and have our being because you love us. You have a plan for us, a purpose for us, a purpose to give us a future and a hope. We belong to you, and you are our Father in heaven. We thank you and love you, and thank you for Jesus, who has made it all possible for us to get to know you and to serve you. We ask your blessing on each one and those that may be listening through electronics, that they too will understand and know and be blessed by the fact that you have chosen us. We're yours. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you, everybody. There are three easy ways to give tonight. The first is through PushPay. Simply text through your smartphone, VF Assembly to 77977. The second is by going to the church website at www.vfassembly.org and click Give at the top right side of your screen. The third way you can give is to mail your giving directly to the church at 15260 Nisqually Road in Victorville, 92395. Thank you and may God bring his richest blessings upon you as you give. God bless. <laughs>